So, man, there's so many things I want to share, but I'm gonna I'm gonna share. Start out by sharing. I um, I get a lot of dreams. Those of you who know me know that, especially of late. So last Sunday night. I probably, I believe, because coming off the weekend that we had last weekend, which was awesome. Amen? Amen? Thank you. I, uh, this one word, this one word was in my spirit that just kept saying it over and over and over and over as I was getting in bed. And he said, son, I want you to remember I said, remember what? He just kept saying it, son. I want you to remember. So I lay down, and I fall asleep pretty quickly. Don't I, hon? Yep. They used to time me when I was on the road. I bunked with one of my roommates, David. He said it takes somewhere between three to five seconds for Steve to fall asleep. <laughs> Sorry for all those of you, it takes an hour to fall asleep. I just, I'm made differently. It's the blessing of God. I fall asleep quick. So I, I do get up quick. So I was having this dream, and I was having a conversation with the Lord, and he said, son, I'm causing you to remember. I'm causing you to remember. So I started thinking about a lot of really cool memories I had as a child that we all have. I was thinking about and remembering all the things that I could remember that had something to do with what I thought he was saying to me in the dream. And he said, son, do you remember when your mom used to quote your scriptures running to the school bus? I said, I do remember those scriptures. I do remember those scriptures. Now, I was single digits, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and yeah, I went up into the teens. So anyway, so many scriptures, a lot of Psalms, and at that time, I remember I told you I gave my heart to Christ when I was five on my grandmother's lap, but then I fell away through my teenage years. But what God was causing me to remember was, even though I was not in a good place, those scriptures were still permeating my spirit as a young boy. And he caused me to remember those scriptures when I rededicated my life to him when I was a late teen. You understand what I'm saying? They all just came alive. Like I've been reading my, my whole life or something, which I had not. I had not. I just heard them. The Bible says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says, right? So he was ministering to me through my mother, through my grandmother, You've heard me tell these stories. So I was remembering those things in this dream. And he said, son, there's, there's some that remember that don't have good remembers. What about those? There's things we remember that we don't want to remember. Hmm. No one knows what I'm talking about. So I started writing down some scriptures. And I'm just going to start reading some of them off to you. Hebrews 8, 12 in the ESV. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. No more. Some of us have to deal with memories in our past that are somewhat painful. And the Lord is saying, I will take them from you if you give them to me so that you will remember them no more, as I have remembered them no more. 
You have rescued me from hell and saved me, Psalm 103, 4, from the Passion. You've rescued me from hell and saved my life. You've crowned me with love and with mercy. Psalm 103, 12. Farther from a sunrise to a sunset, that's how far you've removed our guilt from us. There's a deliverance that comes from remembering for us that are in the Lord. And we need to remember. God always remembers. He likes it when we remember. Because when we remember, we remind him of that remembrance. And it stirs up within him. The very thing that he came to do was to save, set free, heal, and deliver. If you remember, I don't know how many years ago it was, I told a vision I had of, I was in open vision, and some of you were there, that we're in a huge port, like where a ships go out, you know, like New York City or somewhere like that. And I saw lines of people waiting to board this ship, but it wasn't a cruise liner. It was a freight liner. And there were men on this freight liner with four trucks moving all these crates around. And the line was formed, and it was just hundreds of people. And there was a man standing at the foot of the ramp with a clipboard, and he called out people's name, and they got up on that freight liner, and there were seats all around the perimeter of that huge ship, and everyone was to have a seat. Does anybody remember this story, the vision I had? Do you remember that, Frank? So everybody was on board, and we set sail, and we went out to the ocean. And then during this vision, I did not see what I saw. Once we were out there, I saw it. And the man would call who had the clipboard a name. Every single crate had initials on it, and those initials stood for someone's name. So he would call that person out, and that person would come out, and then appear just like out of nowhere. I imagine that. That would be like the Lord. You'd be standing next to him, and he'd have you put your hand on that crate. And he'd just give it this, push. And would go right to the back of the ship. And he said, let it go. I didn't tell Tom to say that. I didn't tell Tom to say that. He said, that's in my notes. Several years ago, I shared a vision, okay? You can't script this stuff with Holy Spirit. Let it go. And he said, as far as the east is from the west, I will remember no more into the sea of forgetfulness. Where is that scripture? Where is that scripture? Micah, chapter 7, if you're taking notes, 19 and 20 in the message. Where is the God? Who can compare with you? Wiping the slate clean of guilt. Isn't that awesome news, Ken? Wiping our slate clean of guilt. You know what I'm talking about. We've talked about it. Because we all deal with it. We all have dealt with it. Turning a blind eye, a deaf ear, to the past sins of your purged and precious people. You don't nurse your anger and don't stay angry long, for mercy is your specialty. That's what you love most, and compassion is on its way to us. You'll stamp out the wrongdoing. You'll sink our sins to the bottom of the ocean. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You'll stay true to your word, Father Jacob. And continue the compassion you show to Grandfather Abraham. Everything you promise to our ancestors from a long, long time ago. Again, Micah 7, 19 and 20 in the message translation. We need to remember these types of scripture. You'll hear Pastor Tom talk about committing scriptures to memory. That's why. 
As I shared in the beginning, when the Lord told me to remember, he brought back to my recall those scriptures that I would hear my grandmother and my mother speak over us as children. That's why I said our children need to be in our midst. They need to hear. Don't think for a moment there are one or two or three they don't hear. They hear. They hear. You're hearing me this morning. Jesus. There are so many things. There are so many things. Dear God. Tom looked at me this morning and he said, is your spirit okay? I said, yeah. He said, you sure? I said, yeah. I said, it's been a week of a lot of resistance because we're in that time. And just me preparing this word, Marge and I have been battling. I spent Friday in the hospital getting x-rays of my chest again. I went into a coffin spell Thursday afternoon that was uncontrollable. And it hurt. And it hurt to breathe. And I had no wind. But after having done all, I stand. See, there are times that things happen to us that we need to recognize where they come from. I recognize those things as an attack because I'm here to deliver a message to you. There are things that happen to us as an attack. But I'm going to talk about those things and I'm going to talk about things that happen because of what we have before us here, the table of the Lord. Why did I put it out here today? Because I want you to remember. Because what did he say? Do this in remembrance of me. In this dream, when he was reminding me the scriptures that my mother gave me, I started to weep so strongly and thankfully because of the things that he brought to my remembrance. It's the things that he brings to remembrance when you're in a conversation talking to someone that out of your belly, out of your inward parts, come rivers. You may not remember them intellectually, but they're going to come up out of your spirit when you need them. Are you hearing me? But we need to position ourselves today. Dear Jesus, give me wisdom in sharing these stories. We're living in a time, I believe, that God is cleaning the house. Yeah. Amen? He's cleaning the house. I have a dear friend. I'm related to her through marriage. And um, we keep in contact. She lives several states away. No names are going to be given. You don't need to know names. I'm just going to tell you something she sent to me. Of a visiting minister, an evangelist slash apostle. Some of you might know his name, but I'm not going to use it because it doesn't matter. So the story goes, and I saw the video clip. He was invited to a church that some of the people were asking and crying out for revival. So he comes in where the Lord of the Lord is ministering in the house. And there time come, came time to minister after he delivered the word. And it was a pastor on the stage and this man on the stage. And they started to pray. And there were people that were just entering into worship, putting up their hands and worshiping God. And there was this lady two rows back who started to speak in tongues. And he said, normally, when I hear that, my spirit goes like this. But it's, this is the, the guest speaker saying this, okay? But instead, my spirit did this. And I turned to Pastor, and I said, Pastor, that woman in the second row is speaking in a tongue, but it's not the Holy Spirit. It's witchcraft. She's cursing you in this church. And the pastor stepped back. Who do you think you're talking to? That's my head prayer intercessor right there. Now, you're the guest speaker. What do you do with that one? So, Holy Spirit said, you had better do what I sent you there to do. So he looked at the woman, he pointed to her, and he said, I command you in the name of Jesus to say what you're saying in your tongue in English. And her face distorted. 
F you, F your God, F this church. And she ran out of the house. This is the day we're living in, people. Are you hearing me? The demons are not going to be able to say. It's witchcraft. Needless to say, the pastor was in a heap on the floor, crying out for repentance, and that church went into revival and is still in it today. <laughs> you, you catching my drift? This is the day we're living in. God is dealing with His church. This week, this week, there's someone I know, and I'm, again, not saying names, they do not belong to this church, but... They post a lot on social media, and I see a lot of it, and it just bothered my spirit, because I know this person. It's a young person, and it's been bothering me, it's been grieving me. So God, let me cross paths with this young person this week, and I called this young person out on it. And what this person was doing was, on social media, posting things about another ministry that was not good. And so I said to this person, that's dangerous ground. I have been in and around ministry 40 years, and I have seen people get sick and die because of judgment that was not theirs to bring out. It's dangerous ground. I'm warning you because I love you. Please don't get sucked into it. There's a spirit that's not of God in that whole thing. And this person thanked me, and said, I will pray on it. And we will continue the conversation. Again, this is the day we're in. The enemy doesn't care who he uses. If he can distract and yield, bring someone out of a place with a distraction, he'll do it. How many of you have heard the name Uzzah? And remember the name Uzzah? From 2 Samuel 6? Uzzah was a man who was on the crew transferring the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of God, okay? And the word was, no one touches the Ark. They were in a new uh, cart, if you will, being pulled by oxen, transporting the Ark. And he was with one of the men assigned to that. The ark lost his balance. He reached out and touched the ark to keep it from falling and immediately was struck dead. Yep. Now, some of you may say, that's a bit harsh. <laughs> that's a bit harsh. But there's something you need to see in this. The Bible, if you read the account, and I have studied it out, it said, Uzzah had presumption in his heart. See, our God is a God of the heart. He took Saul out of power and put David in, because what does he say about David? Yeah. <sighs> Acts 13, 22. In New King James. And when he had removed him, Saul, he raised up from them David as king, to whom he also gave testimony and said this, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart to do my will. That's what God's looking for in this hour. So if you read the footnotes and you do a study about Uzzah, it said he was presumptuous. So, you know, again, we understand the Spirit of the Lord was upon certain people in that time, like David, when Samuel put him in and poured a oil over him, a horn of oil. It said, from that day forward, the Spirit of the Lord was upon David, not in him, upon him, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come. We had the Holy Spirit within us. We have no excuse. Uzzah was a natural man. And he said, okay, we got to move this thing again. I mean, you just think about it in the natural. He was a big guy, rugged. His job was to move this. But there's a reverence and an awe and a holiness that you didn't touch the ark. And Uzzah forgot that. He should have remembered that. And he would have been still alive. 
So when we come into the presence of the Lord and we partake of this table, that's why he says, do this in remembrance of me. It's awful quiet in here. For the day comes that shall burn like an oven, and all the proud and arrogant, yes, and all that that do wickedly and all that are lawless shall be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, so that will leave neither root nor branch. But unto you who revere and worshipfully fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings and in his beams. And you shall go forth and gamble like calves released from the stall and leap for joy. Now you all know that's Malachi 1 through 3, and I'm reading that from the Amplified Classic. Sorry? Ma Malachi 4, chapter 4, verses 1 and 3 in the Amplified Classic. Now, I want to talk to you a little another story about my life. When I was 12 years old, you've never heard of this story. We had, we don't, it wasn't a new tractor, it was a new tractor to us. My dad was a wise man, and you spent a lot of money for that new smell. He would buy stuff at auctions and get good deals. And as time went on, he would take me with him. Steve, make sure that motor sounds good before I bid on it. Okay? Because he knew my gift. So, I was 12. He bought this new tractor, turbo diesel, Lou. It had a foot pedal for a gas pedal. First tractor we had that had a foot gas pedal. And that's, because all the rest of them were hand. So it's hard to, you know, do the revs and shift. But with the foot, man, I could just burn. And when you step on a turbo diesel, and the turbo kicks in, the exhaust is right in front of you, and you hear the noise, I love that sound, and black smoke would billow up. I just always loved power as a gearhead. I love power. I love power. Do you hear me? I love power. Is there a spiritual parallel with that in my life? Yeah. So he turns me loose, cultivating. It was an eight, it was an eight row. I could cultivate eight rows of corn at a time. It was in the spring. And back, he didn't, my dad did not use a lot of chemicals on our property, so he would have us cultivate, rip them up the weeds. So he set me up, I'm 12, and I said, I can't wait for him to leave. <laughs> vroom, 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 vroom. So he says, keep it in fourth gear, and stay about this RPM, and you'll be just fine. So he did three or four passes with me. And so he left, and got in his pickup, and he went back to the farm. And I'm just like, this isn't fast enough. <laughs> so I go another gear, fifth gear. <laughs> it's a little more challenging because when you get off a little bit, you didn't run up out one row, you walked out eight rows. Actually, ten rows because it would touch the outside ones, right? So I mastered that, so I go another gear. Now, this thing has 16 speeds. <laughs> I didn't go to the high one, but I went into like 9 or 10, and I'm like booking, and I just love that. Got to the end, picked up the cultivators, dropped them down, hydraulic cylinder, whoosh, in you go, off you go. Now, there are some turns in the fields, so you got to be careful. you got to be on your toes all the time. So I was like, you know, this was a challenge, but I'm going way too fast. And I got off, and whoosh, I looked behind me, and I stopped. Oh, my God, he's going to kill me. <laughs> Corn ripped up, weeds ripped up. He comes back an hour later, and half of the field is destroyed. Because I'm an idiot. Yeah, I was an idiot. I was a disobedient idiot. I was not really rebellious, but I was an idiot, and I was a disobedient because he told me to keep it in this gear. So he, he didn't see until we went over the knoll and saw the whole field. He looked at me, and he said, what in the hello have you done? <laughs> Shut it off, right there, right in the middle of the field. Walk back to the truck, get in the truck. Well, Craig is home cleaning calf pens. And because you can't learn how to listen, 
you're now going to go clean calf pens. And Craig is going to come and do this. Now, Craig was twice my size. I'm 12. He should be cleaning the patch, calf pens because this is a manure pack that gets this deep. During the winter, you just keep more on, and it packs. That's why they call it a pack. In the springs, you have to clean it out, and you have to take it on the field and spread it on the field. And it's tough pitching. I mean, you spend hours, and I'm there, and I'm cleaning this manure pack, and I'm angry. I'm not, I'm not liking life. And it strolls my mother. Because I'm sure she saw me get out of the truck, hanging my head, walk into the calf barn. Now you all know, if you know the storyline, my mother had been Holy Spirit filled, my dad not yet. My mother got to listen to Catherine Kuhlman, and our kitchen got filled with the Holy Ghost. So the Spirit of God was alive and active in her. She comes out and she gives me the scripture. Did I drop my paper? She said this, Colossians 3, 23. Stevie, and whatever you do, do it as heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. Because I was kind of not happy about pitching cap manure. And you know the funny part again, I was 12. I never, ever, ever, ever forgot that scripture. It went into my spirit because it was delivered by the spirit. I still wasn't happy. I still sweat and I smelled bad when I left that barn. In fact, she made me strip down and buck naked before I came in the house and hosed me off. Because when you clean, you know, there's maggots. I'm just being real here. See, my dad had picked out the hired hand to do it, but because his son was disobedient, his son's now doing it. You follow the spiritual parallel, you know? So I was in training right then. And I have always, always had the attitude, and I've trained many of my employees, and everything that you do, do is unto the Lord. You're not doing it for me. You're doing it for God. And if you do that, he will honor what you do. Because promotion does not come from man. Promotion does not come from the east or the west. Promotion comes from the Lord God Almighty. And you know, I applied that principle to my life. And every time after I left the farm and I broke my dad's heart and told him I wasn't going to take it over and be a dairy farmer, doing this all for the rest of my life. Every job I went to, I started the year, but I was promoted because I carried that scripture in my heart. And everything I did, I did is unto the Lord. And every job I had before I started my own business, I ended up being the top manager in that, that position. And I right here liken it to that. And everything you do, do it is unto the Lord. Is this making sense? <sighs> Acts 7, 47, 50. Acts 7, 47 through 50 in the message. And all this time, our ancestor had a tent, a shrine for true worship, made to the exact specifications God provided Moses. They had it with them as they followed Joshua, when God cleared the land of pagans, and still had it right down to the time of David. David was asked to, for God, asked God for a permanent place for worship. But Solomon built it. Yet, that doesn't mean that the Most High lives in a building made by carpenters or masons. The prophet Isaiah said this and put it well when he wrote, Heaven is my throne. I rest my feet on the earth. So what kind of house will you build me, says your Lord? Where can I get away and relax? But it's already built. And he says, I built it. 1 Corinthians 13 in the message. 1 Corinthians 3, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 3 in the message, verses 16 and 17. You realize, don't you, that you are the temple of God? And God himself is present in you? No one will get by with vandalizing God's temple. And you can be sure of that. God's temple is sacred. And remember, you are that temple. 
So when we come before the Lord in holy communion and there is unrepented sin in our life, the scripture that says this, First Corinthians 11, 23 through 32 in the message. Let me go over it again with you exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so certainly centrally important. I received my instructions from the master himself and passed them on to you. The master Jesus on the night of his betrayal took the bread, having given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he did the same thing with the cup. This is the cup of my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink of this cup, remember me. Remember me. What you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact your words and actions of the death of the master. Are you hearing me? You will be drawn back to this meal again and again and again until the master's return. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Uzzah let familiarity breed contempt. The Bible says his heart was presumptuous. He did not honor God. Anyone who eats the drinks of the cup of the master irreverently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be a part of? Examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy awe. I can almost say I'm prophesying that to you this morning. The reason people die and get sick is not because there's an attack on their life. It's because they come before the table of the Lord with things that they have not resolved in their hearts. Unforgiveness. Holy Spirit, who dwells in you as a temple, will bring to your remembrance. Now, I'm not saying everybody don't misrepresent what pastor's saying here. There is an attack that comes on our life. Marge and I had an attack this week. There are attacks that take people out prematurely and has nothing to do with the table of the Lord. Do you hear in my heart? You need to hear that very clearly because I'm not preaching heresy here. I'm talking about a pure heart before the table of the Lord. Let me continue. If you give no thought... Or worse, you don't care about the broken body of the master when you eat and drink. You're running the risk of serious consequences. That's why so many of you even are listless and sick and others have gone home to an early grave. If we get this straight now, we won't have to be straightened out later on. Better be confronted by the master now than to face the fiery confrontation later. Now, that's a hard word for me to deliver to you. But I think you hear the spirit of what I'm saying in it. That's why I put it out here this morning. And I'm going to start doing it every time we have communion. Just so that we can remember and be mindful of what we're doing. See, because we are the temple and the veil's been torn... And we carry... Remember what Bill Johnson says? If you realize that you had the dove resting upon you, would you walk differently? Would you talk differently? Would you think differently? So we have that. So we can walk up and we can touch that which is holy. We can partake of that which is holy. Something they couldn't do in the Old Covenant like we can today. Only the priest was allowed to do that, the high priest, right? I don't need to go into that teaching. You understand that. But the reality of it is, this is for us as a body of believers who love and worship our God and fear Him with reverence. It's 12.05.
We're going to take communion this morning. But I'm going to ask that each of you, each of you, take inventory of your hearts right now. I'm just going to ask for a few minutes of silence. Get before the Lord and do business. It's not about me. It's about what you have to do business with. There were things in my life at one time that I had to get on the telephone before I could take communion and ask a brother to forgive me for something I said to him years before. That's just how this Holy Spirit works. You know? Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. We're in a unique time. Let me share now with you the other part of that dream. He said, son, tell my people this. If they come before my table with a right heart, then I am going to stir again the reason why I did what I did. And when you take of the bread and you drink of the cup, there is going to be instant healing in their bodies where they've been crying out for healing. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus Christ is. This is a fresh dream. I take this very seriously. I tell you, my wife and I have been warring under this all week. That's what Tom said to me. Steve, is your spirit okay? It's been a tough week. But now I've delivered the message to you. And it's on you what you do with it. So let's just take a few moments. Some people get uncomfortable in silence. It's good. Okay, this is the scripture God gave me to read before we take communion. It's from the book that we've been studying for several weeks, actually probably a couple months now, and that's Ephesians. I'm reading to you from Ephesians 4, 17 through 32 in the ESV. This particular chapter is called The New Life. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy practice of every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off the old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through and through and deceitful desires and be renewed by the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil, not the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths but only such that is as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away with, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as Christ has forgiven you. And then he said, just close with the scripture before we take it. This is from Romans 16, 20 in the Passion. 
And the God of peace will swiftly, swiftly, say swiftly, pound Satan to a pulp under your feet, and the wonderful favor of the Lord Jesus will surround you. What an awesome promise. Father, we take hold of your promises.